sure that there's actually anybody that embraces a fully non-historical view, although maybe utilitarianism comes closest. But in any case, Nozick's theory is certainly historical. The more interesting distinction Nozick makes among different theories of distributive justice is the distinction between patterned and unpatterned theories of distributive justice. It says, consider as an example the principle of distribution according to moral merit. This principle requires that total distributive shares vary directly with moral merit. No person should have a greater share than anyone whose moral merit is greater. Or consider the principle that results by substituting usefulness to society for moral merit in the previous principle. Or we might consider distribute according to the weighted sum of moral merit and usefulness to society and need with the weights of the different dimensions equal. Let us call a principle of distribution patterned if it specifies that a distribution is to vary along some natural dimension or a weighted sum of natural dimensions or lexico lexicographical ordering of natural dimensions. And let us say a distribution is patterned if it accords with some patterned principle. Almost every suggested principle of distributive justice is patterned. All right, so what's he talking about here? Well, the basic idea is that a, so the pattern principles of distributive justice are ones that fill in, that give us a sensible way to fill in the schema to each according to their blank. Okay, so if a distributive principle tells us, you know, to each according to their blank, and we understand what the blank means, uh, then that's basically a test for whether a principle of distribution is patterned. Okay, now interestingly, here's Nozick again, the principle of entitlement we have sketched is not patterned. There is no one natural dimension or weighted sum or combination of a small number of natural dimensions that yields the distributions generated in accordance with the principle of entitlement. The set of holdings that results when some persons receive their marginal products, others win at gambling, others receive a share of their maid's income, others receive gifts from foundations, others receive interest on loans, others receive gifts from admirers, others receive returns on investment, others make for themselves much of what they have, others find things, and so on, will not be patterned. Right, so in this way, the principle of the entitlement theory is very different. Right, utilitarianism, the difference principle, egalitarian views, principles of, you know, say, to each according to their need or merit or whatever, those are all patterned views. But the entitlement theory is not, right? There's no, the entitlement theory does not give us a good way to fill in the blank to each according to their X, right? Uh, some people, if the entitlement theory is right, or if a society is governed by the entitlement theory, some people are going to have lots of stuff, and some of them will be bad people who contribute little, and there's not necessarily any injustice there. While other people, right, will be forever destitute. And some of those people will be thoughtful, creative, useful, and so on, and there need not be any injustice there either. Right? There's no kind of uh, uh, natural criterion that you can give to determine whether a, a, a distribution is just according to the entitlement theory. And this makes it kind of unique. Right? So as we can see in this lovely, if I do say so, table, right? so we have these, these, these two kind of axes uh, that theories of distributive justice can have a place on, right? Theories are either patterned or unpatterned, right? and some, and they're and they're also either historical or end state slash current time slash slash end result, right? So uh, Nozick gives us examples of theories that go in three of the four boxes, right? Patterned historical theories include, for example. Uh, principles that tell us to distribute things according to moral merit or according to how useful somebody has been to society, uh, tell us to distribute things according to how hard people have worked and so on, right? These are all historical pattern theories because they look at the past to determine justice, but they also make they also look at whether uh, the past series of events has met a certain pattern. We also get patterned end state or current time slice theories, according to Nozick. Right, he includes here the difference principle, utilitarianism. He would probably put Nielsen's view here. We also have theories that would go here, like to each according to their need, right, or to each according to their IQ. 
right? For those principles, you don't look to the past to determine whether uh, distribution is just, but you do have to uh, assess the current distribution according to whether it meets this pattern or not, right? This criterion or not. Now, unlike either of those, right? Nozick's theory is unpatterned. There's no natural dimension that a just distribution has to meet, um, but it is historical as opposed to end state. Now, an interesting exercise is, can you imagine an even remotely plausible theory that's both in, unpatterned and end state? Is there a theory where uh, a, print, a, a distribution can be just, <laughs> even if you don't have to look to how it was arrived at, so it's not historical, and it doesn't have to meet any pattern at all? I mean, maybe, maybe a theory that could go here is just uh, pure randomness. If, if distribution is arrived at purely randomly, right, maybe that's the, the theory that could go in that fourth box there. But in any case, uh, all the theories of interest for us are not in that in those boxes. Okay, now why unpatterned theories are really weird, right? As Nozick, as we pointed out, right? Uh, sorry, almost every suggested principle of distributive justice is patterned, and it's very clear why that would be, right? These are just these seem the the patterns just seem to be the theory of distributive justice. So how can Nozick? Uh, endorse an unpatterned theory. Isn't that just crazy? Well, he has some interesting arguments against patterned theories. I think the most the most interesting of all is the Wilt Chamberlain case. So we're going to talk about that in some detail. All right. So suppose a distribution favored by one of the non-entitlement conceptions of distributive justice is realized. All right. Let us suppose it's your favorite one and let us call this distribution D1. Right? Perhaps everyone has an equal share, perhaps shares vary in accordance with some dimension you treasure, or whatever. All right, so Nozick's idea is, at the start here, imagine that everything is as you think it should be. Okay, So at time t1, what we have in, in, the, in effect is distribution d1. All right? Whatever distribution you think is the most just, that's what obtains at d1. So it's, if, you, if like Lionel Hutz, you think a perfect society is one without lawyers, uh, and that would be kind of utopian, that's what's going on at D1. Okay, now, second step. Now suppose that Will Chamberlain is greatly in demand by basketball teams, being a great gate attraction. Also, suppose contracts run only for a year with players being free agents. And suppose he signs the following sort of contract with a team. In each home game, 25 cents from the price of each ticket of admission goes to him. We ignore the, the question of whether he is gouging the owners, letting them look at for themselves. All right, so there's Wilt over there on the left, uh, doing what he does, playing basketball in an amazing way. So that's the kind of, now we're at our second point in the story. All right, so time T1 preseason, we had a distribution of goods in society that matched whatever your favorite criterion for distrib distribution is. All right, and now at time two, at the beginning of the season, Wilt signs the contract. All right, there he is looking very dapper, just coming from signing the contract. Okay, now we're almost one more step of this important case. Now the season starts, and people cheerfully attend Wilt's team game, team's game. They buy their tickets, each time dropping a separate 25 cents of their admission price into a special box with Chamberlain's name on it, the box picture there on the left. They're excited about seeing him play. It's worth the total admission price to them. Let's suppose that in one season, one million persons attend his home games, and Wilt Chamberlain winds up with $250,000, a much larger sum than the average income, and larger even than anyone else has. Okay. Now that's the important third step of this uh, timeline. So now we're imagining a time, T3, to the end of the season, where Will now has way more money than anyone else in society okay, as a result of the contract he signed with his team and the fans willingly paying their 25 cents to see him play. Okay, now here are Nozick's questions about this case. Is Wilt entitled to this income? 